here on another Sunday. Glad you could join us. Of course, we'd prefer to see you in person uh, at Calvary Chapel, Martin County, when we meet together on Sunday mornings. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. at the Taylor Beach House Cafe in Hope Sound, Florida. It's 9126 Southeast Bridge Road. We'd love to see you there. Please join us. Uh, if you live in the local area, we just love to see you and, and get to meet you and, and spend some time uh, fellowshipping together. That's what we do here at a church. That's, what, that's, that's the whole purpose. So we can grow together and become more like Jesus. Jesus is the reason, by the way, that we continue to see miracles. That's why we're continuing to do what we do. He's behind everything that we do here at Calvary Chapel, Martin County. So thank you for being part of us today here at the online campus. We're glad to see you. All of the teachings that we have are available on our website. If you haven't been there yet, it's calvarychapelmartincounty.org. We also have an app. You can download it from either iTunes or Google Play, and it's Calvary Chapel Martin County. Again, that's the app. And you can download it. It gives you access to all of our teachings, just like going to our website gives you access to all of our teachings. Now, we also have a podcast that's available it's available on the app, it's available online, but it's also available on your favorite podcasting platform, uh, irregardless of what it is. I think we're on almost all of them now. Uh, so you can listen to us on our podcast Monday through Friday. Uh, it's about 26 minutes long. We're studying the book of Isaiah right now, and we try to keep it just right so that it's the average commute length. So that's in kind of an intentional thing for us. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few podcasts now available, so... Uh, and we do have notes connected with all those that are also available online. Let us know how we can pray for you. On our app and on our online site, we have a connection card. And on that card, you can tell us how we can pray with you or for you. And we'd just love to be able to do that. Our midweek Bible study, which, we which does take place every Thursday evening, uh, we meet at Calvary Church Jupiter in Auditorium B at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Now, we do live stream that, so because we're not in Hope Sound, we'd like to be in Hope Sound. We're, please pray with us. We're praying for a building uh, that we can meet in. Uh, we love where we're meeting right now, but it's limited in terms of the times and the, the days that we can actually make use of the facility. So we're praying for a building to be able to meet in so that we can do ministry any day of the week, including the midweek. But right now we're meeting for our midweek Bible study at Calvary Church Jupiter uh, in Auditorium B. And we meet at 6.30. We're studying the book of 2 Thessalonians there right now. Join us. Why not? Uh, join us on Sunday. Join us on Thursday. You can join us live online on Thursdays as well. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you. Uh, we appreciate you doing that. We do have a YouTube channel. And if you would mark like and subscribe. That would also help in terms of being able to grow our outreach and grow the capability for us to reach even more people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're watching us on Facebook, thank you. Same thing. If you would just like us, it, it would be great because it does help increase the overall uh, capability of being able to get the word out. If you're on our website, stay there a while and take a look at some other aspects of the website that are there uh, the longer you're there, the better rating we get and the higher we move up and the better functionality that takes place with search engines to be able to direct people to the, the website for Calvary Chapel, Martin County. Uh, thank you, though, for those of you who are participating with us here on the online campus. Uh, again, the notes are available on the app today. Uh, we are a Calvary Chapel, and we study the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse. That's what we do. So you're going to need your Bible as we study today. We're going to be starting a new book. We're going to be in the book of Revelation. It's the last book of the New Testament, and we're going to be in chapter 1. So you want to make sure you kind of open up your Bibles and get ready to go, because we're going to be picking up in the book of Revelation this morning. Uh, let's pray, and then we'll get into what the Word has to say to us. Father, thank you for gathering us together here online at the online campus. We just are thankful, so thankful for all of those who worship with us here on, on Sundays. And, we, and Lord, we just ask that you would teach us your word now as we study and, and speak to us through what it is that you want us to understand as we begin looking at this new book, the book of Revelation. 
Thank you, Lord, for how it talks to us today and how uh, exciting it's going to be because it's one of those books that, that we actually have a promise for a blessing in it, Lord, and we're looking forward to, to, to receiving that blessing. Thank you now, Lord, for this time that you're going to give us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, we're in the book of Revelation. We're in Revelation chapter 1. It's the last book of the, of the New Testament, the very last one. And, uh, you know, we talked last week about the need for fellowship and the need to uh, spend time with the Lord. And, and, and John was the one who wrote that, uh, that book. It was the book of John. Well, John is also the author of the book of Revelation. And what we're going to see here is that a funny thing happened during devotions the other day. He gets visited by the Lord while he's doing his devotions. John becomes a time traveler. He becomes an eyewitness to the apocalypse. So we're in the book of Revelation, chapter 1. We're going to cover the first 20 verses today. So just as we discovered earlier in John 21, Jesus desires to have fellowship with us. It's actually an expectation of his for those who follow him. And we long for fellowship with him as well. As you become more and more like Jesus and as you learn more about him, you want to spend more time with him in the word and in prayer and sitting and just listening and meditating on his word and, and, and hearing back from him as he shows us what it is that he wants us to do and he guides and directs us through his word and through the Holy Spirit. That's all part of it. Now, Jesus longs for this as well. And that's the place where many times he shows us what it is that he wants us to do. He reveals his will to us when we're spending time with him. It's that's, it's that's the place where he kind of shows us what's in store, what he wants us to be involved in. John understood this. He had learned his lessons when he had been with Jesus for three years. And when he was with Jesus there on the Sea of Galilee, it really hit him that fellowship is what Jesus wants. Jesus prepared the fish. Jesus was ready for them to be there. And he just wanted to sit there and talk with them for a while. So John understands this, and it's become part of his life pattern because as he's writing the book of Revelation, the events that take place in it, they're taking place in 96 AD. This is now uh, not a young man anymore. This is a, a man probably in his mid to late 80s. Uh, and, and, and this has become a pattern of life for him, spending time with the Lord every day. So by this time in his life, all of his close friends, all the disciples that he walked and talked with Jesus with, they've all been killed. They've all been martyred. He's the only one left. They were all martyred for their witness. And he's the old man on the outs right now with the Roman emperor Domitian too. He's been exiled. He was busy pastoring his church in Ephesus and Nope, he said something wrong or did something wrong, and he was exiled to this little Greek island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea. So it makes it tough for him to oversee the churches that he's supposed to be overseeing as well as pastoring the church in Ephesus, and he can't spend the time that he wants to with them. It's 96 AD, and John is about to discover that even at his advanced age, Jesus is not finished with him yet. Yes, there have been rumors floating around that he's going to live to see Jesus Christ remove his church, but they're rumors. He even referenced it earlier when he wrote his gospel, the book of John, between Paul, Peter, and Jude, all of them writing letters. The church knew about the last days. The church knew about the rapture, knew about the lay of the land, of what the, the day of the Lord would look like. They, they knew about the pre-day of the Lord removal, the rapture of the church. They, they knew about uh, Jesus making a promise. John wrote about that in John 14, but they now know also the church knows how that's going to be fulfilled through the rapture. Paul let us know more about the timing and the, how it will work in his letters to the church in Thessalonica and to the church in Corinth. But as of this point in time, when we're in 96 AD, the details of what's going to take place during the day of the Lord are still a little foggy. There's, there's information in the scriptures about it, but not all the detail that we see in the book of Revelation. So let's take one more look before we move forward and look at what Jesus said, talking to Peter there in Galilee, 
post-resurrection, about two or three weeks after the resurrection took place. John 21, verses 20 to 23. Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had also leaned back on his chest at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who, who is betraying you? Now, this is John. He's talking about John, okay? So Peter, upon seeing him, said, Jesus, said this to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Because Peter had just been told he was going to be a martyr, and he wanted to know about his friend, John. And Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Therefore, this account went out among the brothers that the disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him he would not die. But only if I want him to remain until I come, what is that to you? And with those words, as we reviewed in our study of John, the other disciples began the first round of trying to figure out when Jesus was going to come back. That's still a popular thing to do today. Not something that we're asked to do. In fact, we're told not to do that. Uh, we're not to be engaged in doing that. But it's been going on ever since Jesus talked to Peter. Now, while praying and waiting on the Lord, that's what John is doing. He's doing his devotions that he does every day. He's in a cave. He's on the island of Patmos where he's been exiled. And what happens is Jesus does show up. I mean, in person, in his glorified body, and in his glory to boot. Not something John was expecting after 50, 60 years of talking to the Lord and, and, and hearing the Holy Spirit talk to him. This time he hears a voice. He has an Eli moment. You know who Eli is, okay? Uh, Eli was a young boy. He was going to become a priest and a prophet. Uh, he didn't know he was going to become a prophet, but he was sleeping one evening in the holy place, which is just outside the Holy of Holies inside the tabernacle. Now, the Holy of Holies is where the Ark of the Covenant is, and that's where the nation would come together after a lot of uh, various things that they would have to do for the Day of Atonement, and, and, and the blood would be applied to the seat, to the mercy seat there on the, uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. Well, here's this young boy. He's sleeping in the holy place, and after a lot of different things take place, he's told that when you hear this voice again saying, Eli, Eli, say, Lord, what is it that you want? Well, what happens is the Lord actually walks out from behind that curtain and talks with Eli. Now, being a young boy, he's going like, well, I guess this is what the Lord does. And it didn't shake him up. Well, what happens to Paul is he has an Eli moment, but it's more like Eli on steroids. Because he gets to look through and see Jesus in all his glory. It, what happens to John makes what happened to Eli look like nothing. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, we, ha we hear from John what he, see what he says happens. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. So he's praying, he's talking to the Lord, he's spending time with the Lord, he's worshiping him, just as he does. And I heard behind me a loud voice, like the sound of a trumpet, saying, write on a scroll what you see, and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. How cool is that, that Jesus shows up at John's devotions? Now, Jesus has been there all the time, but not physically. Now he's physically there. And he says, hey, John, could you take a letter for me? You know, something to ponder also as we see this, and we take a look at what was earlier told by Jesus to Peter in John chapter 21 is it possible that John did indeed remain until I come? I mean, Jesus shows up in John's cave on Patmos in person in his glorified body. Later in Revelation 4, John is going to be told by Jesus, come up here. The exact same words the whole church will hear when we're raptured and taken to be with Jesus while the tribulation's going on here on planet Earth. And then there's John, time traveler, seeing and reporting on the events that he sees taking place in heaven and on earth as the wrath of God is poured out onto an unbelieving planet. 
ultimately, John provides us an eyewitness account of Jesus Christ breaking through the darkness of Armageddon to save his people, the Jews, and finalize his assumption of the ownership of planet Earth, his second coming, and kicking out the usurper once and for all. So again, I have to ask, does he not, does he not wind up being there until Jesus comes? Sounds like, yeah, he did indeed remain until I come. He saw all of it. We're beginning a great adventure today as we go into the book of Revelation. This is a study of the one book that some people think they know, but they don't. Some people really do know the book. And then there are those who are scared to death to read it or study it because they think it's confusing or they don't want to know it or they're scared about what's going on or they think it's hard to understand, and it's not. Now, you have to remember, it's literally an Old Testament book in the New Testament. There's a lot of Old Testament references in this book, over 800 when you start and take a look at it. So I get it. Many in the church today have so disconnected from the Old Testament, and they don't know what the Old Testament says because they have teachers who are majoring on the New Testament that they may not know what the Old Testament actually says. So when you see a very Jewish book show up at the very end of the New Testament, confusion sets in. The name of the book is Revelation. Okay, That means that something's being revealed here. It's not Mysterion or Gotcha. It's none of that. Okay, The, the intent is for us, followers of Jesus Christ, believers, to fully get what it is he wants to tell us. Remember what Jesus taught about the Holy Spirit's ministry in John 16? In John 16, verse 13, we see this. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, now these are jobs that the Holy Spirit's going to be doing in us, he will guide you into all the truth. So he will make sure that we understand what the Scriptures say. He will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He also teaches us about prophecy. Okay? He will glorify me, and he will take from mine, and will disclose it to you. His job, the Holy Spirit's job in each believer is to reveal God's word to us, to show us what he is saying. All things that the Father has are mine, and this is why I said that he takes from mine and will disclose it to you. The intent of Jesus as he shares this revelation given to him by the Father is for John and for all of us to understand what he's laying out about the things which must soon take place. So let's take a look at the first three verses of Revelation, okay? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ everything that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written in it, for the time is near. The book is prophecy. It is. But for John, it's more than that. You see, John is going to become a time traveler. He is going to be an eyewitness to prehistory. He's going to see things before they happen. He's going to be taken to the events as they're occurring, and then he's going to try and explain them to us here in the book of Revelation. When he writes to us, he's telling us history. He's telling us events he has seen happen. He was there. The book is about Jesus as well. Now, Jesus is the rock star of this book, okay? He's unveiling all of this for us as believers, to understand. He wants us to see it. He wants us to know it. He wants us to understand it. The book itself comes with a promise. There is a built-in outline also in this book. So it's very, very put, well put together from the viewpoint of there's a promise of blessing and there's also an outline. And Jesus is the one who provides that. Now, first, the promise. Now, this is a guarantee from Jesus through John of blessings, times three, for those who, uh, here it is in verse three, blessed is the one who reads, those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written in it. 
for the time is near. And the Greek word there for reads is read out loud, okay? So when you read the Greek, again, means out loud, when you read this book, you're going to be blessed. When you hear me read from the book and the Spirit speaks and you're listening to him, you're going to be blessed. And as you keep what it is that we learn in this book and you start following it and taking it to heart, you're going to be blessed. Blessing times three. I mean, we get this opportunity to study a book of the Bible that has blessing attached to it every time we sit down and look at it. That's exciting when you stop and think about that. Now, it's obvious that one cannot keep, as we're told to here in the in this promise, what you don't possess. Well, how can you be? How can you possess it if you don't understand it? The intent is for us to understand what's in this book, so that we can be blessed by it. It presupposes that everyone who reads and hears will be able to understand and then appropriate what we're being told in the text. And it can only be true if we take it literally. So what that means is we're going to take the book at face value. Yeah, there are some interesting symbols in it, but we're going to take it at face value. There's not, it's not filled with allegory. It's not pointing to different things. I mean, you can read some commentaries where it sounds like somebody putting together instructions on how to program a VCR or something like that. It, it's not that complicated. Okay, it's, We're going to look at it at face value. Now, did you just to see that last phrase? The time is near. How near? The events in this book, once we get to chapter 4, all take place after the rapture of the church. The view will be of earth, and the church is no longer mentioned because the church is with Jesus. So, I mean, once we get to chapter 4, we're done hearing about the church. The rapture, the rapture of the church, the removal of the church from planet earth, Jesus coming and taking us to be with him, as he promised in John 14, can take place at any time. There's nothing that has to happen beforehand. There are no signs. There are no warnings. It's just, bang, it takes place. Paul expected it to take place in his lifetime. He actually writes using those kinds of terms in the book of 1 Thessalonians, especially in chapter 4. I do too. I believe that Jesus is coming in my lifetime. The signs that we talk about, those that we see that are around us today, are signs of the second coming of Jesus. Those are the things that we start seeing piling up, pointing to the fact that the time is incredibly near when he is going to come back. Well, before he can come back, we got to be out of here. And then there's a seven-year time period after that called the tribulation that's got to take place. But all the signs are starting to converge now, and they're pointing to the second coming of Christ. Jesus said the things must being revealed must soon take place. But Ken, hey, wait a minute. John's writing this in 96 AD. We're living in the 21st century. You know, almost 2,000 years have gone by. How can you possibly agree with his statement? I do. I do agree with it. You have to look at the Greek, the language that John writes this book in. What he's saying is that once the events begin to take place, they will do so at a rapid pace. Be like a snowball rolling downhill. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it gets faster and faster and faster. The Greek word here is take. We actually get the word tachometer from that. In other words, once the events outlined in Revelation start, look out. There's not going to be anything to stop them. They will all go to completion. And about that outline, that's in verse 19, okay? Jesus gives it to us in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Therefore, write the things which you've seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. Now, the things which you have seen is Revelation chapter 1, the whole chapter, verses 1 to 20. Okay, so those are the things you have seen. The things which are. In other words, what's going on within the body of the church today. That's chapter 2 and chapter 3. It's the seven letters to the seven churches. Okay? So that's chapter 2, verse 1 to chapter 3, verse 22. And then the things which take place after these things. Now, that's the rest of the book of Revelation. Chapter 4, verse 1 to the end of the book. 
Now, if you need more detail than that, I'll leave it for you to review the notes. I have them in the notes on the app in online. I'm not going to go through them. We will cover them, though, as we start the study and we go through the book. So let's start our study, and we'll pick up at the very beginning of the book. Again, we'll take a look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ everything that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things which are written in it for the time is near. Now, the very first word, which is revelation, is actually one Greek word. It, we see the revelation, but in the Greek it just says apocalypsis. We get the word apocalypse from that. It means fully known, disclosure. So the disclosure of Jesus Christ, this is what Jesus is being told by the Father. It's not a hiding, it's a revealing, and he wants us to know this. This is the very first word, and it tells us that he wants us to understand what has been revealed to him by the Father. Now, in the English, we have an article thrown in front of it, the Revelation, but there's not an article in the Greek. This is a revelation. It's not the revelation. It's just a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a revealing of Jesus Christ. It implies not just to and from, but of him as well. It's a manifestation of Jesus to us as to what he's going to be doing during the end of the age. John 15, 15 gives us an explanation as to why it's important for Jesus to tell us this now, okay? Because as he was preparing to go to the cross, he says this to his disciples. No longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends because all things I've heard from my father I've made known to you. So up to that point, everything that Jesus had heard, he told them. Now that Jesus has returned to the Father and he's at the right hand of the Father, the Father has now revealed something further to him and Jesus wants us, his friends, his brothers and sisters, to know this. So he wants it to be revealed to us. God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to the angels. The angels mediated it to John, and John writes it all down. The intent is for us to know what is in the text. God gave this to Jesus specifically to show us, to signify, that's kind of what the Greek word there means, for us, showing signs. In other words, John's going to be a witness. He's going to see some of this. What's to come? We're to know this. We're supposed to know it. He's giving it to us, and as friends, we've got a need to know. I used to be in the military, and there were times where I didn't want to know, but I needed to know, and then there were times where I needed to know, and I kind of wanted to know. Uh, and, and, but this is one of those situations that because we're his friends, he wants us to know. We have a need to know. He wants us to be able to use what is in this book and take that to heart so that we can continue ministry and continue reaching the world for Jesus Christ because the time is indeed short and we need to understand that. So we don't tamper with this. We don't add to it. We don't subtract from it. We don't alter it. We're just simply to communicate it. In fact, in the, at the end of the book, we're told this in Revelation 22, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. I'm not going to add anything to this, okay? And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which is written in this book. Therefore, we just, here's what the word says. Here's what it says. I'm not taking anything away. I'm not adding anything. You're gonna, what we're going to teach and what we're going to study and what we're going to learn is simply what's in the text here in the book of Revelation. The visions of this book are an uncovering of hidden truths. Namely, the hidden reality that God is in control of the future. He's in control of everything. 
and how he's going to bring an end to what we see right now, which is it looks like evil's winning. Evil will not win. It all stops when Jesus Christ returns at the end of the age, and we'll see that in this book. How unique is this book? It's pretty unique. It's the only book in the Bible sent and delivered by angels. It's the only one. There is this determination to make sure nothing gets altered all the way from God to John. They all show up throughout the book. Angels, by the way. The unseen realm. It's all over this book. You can't get away from it. John tells us he's the recipient. He's the eyewitness also of the events to be described in this book. He's going to be picked up and taken through time. He was there. He's going to do his best to tell us what he sees. But you have to remember this, okay? John has never seen Star Wars. He's going to do his best, okay? But you got to remember, this is a guy living in 96 AD. He's grown up in the Middle East. He's uh, been in around farm communities and some folks who do a little bit of pottery and some stonework and all that, but you know, not a lot of techn technology going on back around 96 AD. So he's going to witness modern weapon systems from the 21st century at the end of the first. He's going to witness how modern militaries operate in the field and, and how aviation is involved as part of that. And then he's going to try and describe it to us in terms that he understands, but we may struggle with because he's trying to explain something he's never seen before in terms that he's familiar with. He's going to be a witness, and, and here's the thing you have to understand. He will witness the usage of holograms, computers, quantum computers, space-based weaponry, biological warfare, advanced drone technology, tra and transhuman genetic manipulation, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. He's going to be looking at a lot of this new modern technology that we read about in the news all the time. Well, John's going to see it all in operation in, on the battlefield of planet Earth in the last days. And here's the thing. Not only will the events in this book, once they start, roll downhill one and after another, but the language used is done in, with the intent of creating an expectation in us. The expectation of it all happening very soon, like right now. The expectation of soon fulfillment is what produces in us responsibility. As we read and we study, we're going to realize I don't have a friend that knows this. I, there's this friend of mine, he doesn't know this, and right now he's going to get left behind, and I don't want him to go through what we're studying here. There's some horrible things that, that will happen to those who are left behind. And you don't want to be here and take a chance that you're going to be okay. Very slim chance that you'll be okay. Especially when we start talking about population changes and how many people are alive at the beginning versus how many we think will enter the millennial kingdom. We're, we're supposed to be responsible. And by studying this book, we will become absorbed with the fact that we need to tell our friends and our neighbors who don't know about Jesus about Jesus because these events will seem to us that they're going to be happening like tomorrow and they could they very well could verse 4 of Revelation 1 John to the seven churches that are in Asia grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he made us into a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Now, that's how you start a letter, okay? That's the beginning of the letter. Wow. <laughs> John is writing this book to the seven churches. You know, he's given us the background, and now he's given us the, the entree to the book. 
He's writing this to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now today we call that part of the world Turkey, okay? There are a lot more churches than the ones that he's going to reference in this. There's a reason why there's just these seven churches and there's a reason why they're gonna be referenced in the order they are. We'll talk more about that next time. But it's for all the churches. It's for us today as well. All three members of the Trinity here at the beginning of this letter are linked together. First, you have the Father, that's Yahweh. He who is and who was and who is to come, that is Yahweh. It's a literal meaning of his name communicated to Moses. Yahweh is a, actually a compound form of three words according to uh, Ironside. He says it, the first means he is, the second means he was, the third means he will be or he will come. So you have these three words combined together, Yahweh, but it means those things. Then the Holy Spirit is referenced. Now, the reference of the seven spirits is a pointer to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. There we read, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. This is a messianic prophecy, okay? We're talking about Jesus. And a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, and might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. It's the second time we're going to see the, that we've seen the number seven pop up, too. By the way, seven is all over this book. It's everywhere. Seven, by the way, in the scriptures means perfection or completion. And for those geeks who are watching right now, Jesus is referenced 14 times in the book of Revelation. Two times seven. The lamb is referenced 28 times. Four times seven. You have seven churches, you have seven seals, you have seven trumpets, you have seven bowls, you have seven blessings, and a seven-headed dragon. Oh, and God is also worshiped with seven terms two different times. Again, seven times two. Here the Holy Spirit is revealed to us as sevenfold in his gracious character and the imputation of his spiritual attributes. It also may be symbolic that it points to the fact that he is indeed before the throne and he is indeed omnipresent. He's everywhere all at once. Then Jesus is referenced. That's the third person of the Trinity here. Well, I, and it's kind of backwards because usually we have Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, here we get Father, Holy Spirit, and the Son. Jesus is referenced, and as John talks about Jesus, he worships and proclaims that it is Jesus who is returning and when he does, Jesus will be returning as the avenger of blood. It's not going to be like the first time he came. It's a very different scenario. We'll talk more about that as we go along too. Now, I remember wondering just, and he says, every eye will see him. And it used to be that you'd sit there and go, well, how is that going to happen? I remember wondering, how is everyone going to see Jesus as he enters the atmosphere returning to the planet unless he goes around the planet once before he lands in Israel? You know, how's that going to happen? Pastors like Harry Ironside, when he wrote about the book of Revelation, he conjectured, well, it's going to have to be some kind of miracle to happen. But today, we know, thanks to global television and cell phones, you can see stuff going on anywhere in the world within two minutes of it happening. Not a problem. Or you can have it live streamed to you right now. So what in past ages we would think was be a miracle, eh, it's just technology and it's eminently doable. But what we learn here in this text is that Jesus is the faithful witness. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He's the one that walked out of the grave and will never die again. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is as in judgment as well as in the kingdom. He loves us. And when he says that, it's in the present tense. He is, and what, the, what John is telling us and what Jesus is telling us here is, he is continually loving us with no intention of ever stopping. He's the one who freed us from our sin. This points back to the word he used on the cross, which is tetelestai, the last word he says, meaning it is finished or paid in full. He's the one that paid the price. He freed us from the slave market of sin, and he's freed us from the penalty of sin through his death and his resurrection. And he has made us to be a kingdom of priests. 
So what that does then is leads John into praise. And then we get a bonus. John gives us greetings from Jesus himself. Jesus declares in his greeting, he is God. Now, here in the original Greek, omega is not spelled out. You know, you would think it would be spelled out omega. It's not. Alpha is. Well, why is that? Christ is the beginning. The beginning's already completed. The end hasn't yet happened, so it's not spelled out. One day he will complete God's program. It hasn't occurred yet, and it kind of shows up in the language. And with that, John takes us to what it was that disturbed his devotions that day in, his, in the cave there in Patmos. This is a place where he's gone ever since he's been exiled to spend time with the Lord. He's quiet. He's away from everybody else. It's probably nice and cool. Uh, don't know what time of day he's gone there. And we come to verse 9. I, John, your brother and fellow participant in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet saying, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. It's not a reference here, by the way, to the tribulation. This is a reference to his present situation. He's on the outs with the Roman emperor Domitian. He's in exile, and the church is actually being persecuted, and his being exiled is part of that persecution. But here's the thing. As believers, we are part of his kingdom now, but we're also part of his kingdom in the future. So kingdom is very relevant to us because we're all working to reach others for the kingdom right now, to be brought in. Now, John had been pastoring the church there in Ephesus. He was exiled to Patmos, and he was there until Domitian dies. Then Emperor Nerva releases him and lets him go back to Ephesus, where he does some more pastoring work. Right now, though, when, this is being, when, he, when this, he's getting this vision, he's working in the quarries, and again, he's in his 80s, and waiting on the Lord. And it's there, during his time alone with the Lord, that he hears a voice. Now, here's the thing. I'm in a cave, I'm by myself, I'm praying, and I hear a big voice behind me. I don't hear anybody walk in. So before he's even done, I'm going to turn, I, I would do this, and, I, and he, the text tells us this too, he starts turning around. He's commanded to write down everything he sees and send it to all seven churches. So this is not just a letter to one church, he's sending it to all seven, and he's going to send it to all the churches as a result. The reality is, it's this message is for all the churches. Yes, there are seven that are referenced. And the order is going to be a familiar travel pattern as he visits the circuit of churches. He's probably walked this, or, this order before. But there's other churches there that, that aren't referenced. The whole book is to go to these seven churches. And John is familiar with the conditions that go on in all of the churches there. He's been there. He's ministered to them. He knows what's going on there. So just who is this that squeezed into his cave and snuck in behind him, very quietly, by the way. So he turns around, and the text kind of tells us this in the, Germ in the, in the Greek. He's turning around, even as the voice is speaking to him, to look, and he discovers, I'm not in Patmos anymore. Everything's changed. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. And after turning, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and wrapped around the chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, when it's been heated to a glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters." In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, there are seven, the, that Greek word is luxni, okay? We get lux or lights from that. 
And they're not candlesticks, and that does show up in some translations. These are big, giant pedestals, each one with a vessel on it for oil. And then you would have uh, a wick there as well, and it would be burning very, very bright. These are big, bright, light-producing uh, lamp lampstands. And these grand holders where they are placed, it seems like they're kind of like in a circle. They're elevated, and in the middle of them is the Lord, and he's walking in their midst. Now, they're made of gold, and, and here's the thing. John has no idea what these mean. But he's telling you what he's seeing. He does recognize the person walking around these stands, though. And once he recognizes who it is, we see what he does in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. And the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore, write the things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. John responds to what he sees. And he does exactly what you or I would probably do if we saw Jesus Christ in all his glory in front of us. He falls right to the floor and put, I mean, bam, he's on the, he's on the ground. We'd do the same thing if we saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. It's a natural reaction. By the way, John's going to do this several times in this book. He's going to fall in, into, into the mode of worship. John has been with Jesus for three years. He knows Jesus. He knows his voice. He knows, he knows his touch. He knows what he talks about. He knows Jesus. He was at the crucifixion. He's talked with him post-resurrection. He's eaten his cooking after the resurrection. But this is new. He only saw Jesus in his glory once, and that was at the transfiguration. It wasn't anything like this. Now he's seeing the resurrected Christ in all his glory, and he's overwhelmed. Jesus knows John, too. He knows all of us, and he moves quickly to touch him. And John may recognize that touch. It, it, there may be a way that Jesus always grabbed him on the shoulder or something, and immediately you know who that is when they do that. And, and he touches John and reassures him. He tells John, don't be afraid. Now, there are reasons not to be afraid, and then Jesus starts going through those, saying, here's why you shouldn't be afraid. First of all, Jesus is God of all eternity. Don't be afraid because Jesus is God of the past, present, and the future. He's in charge of all of it. Jesus also states he's the one who is resurrected never to die again. Don't be afraid. He's resurrected. Remember, John, you were there? It's me. Trust me. And one more thing. Jesus is the one who now has the keys to death and Hades, not Satan. Remember, Hades is the Greek word for Sheol, the place where those who die without Christ go to. Well, Jesus has the key, not Satan. So in light of this, John, don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. I've got a job for you. John, take a letter. <laughs> That's the job. So he says in verse 19, Therefore, write the things which you've seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw on my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Revelation 119 is also the outline for our book. John will be obedient to the command of Christ here. And he will indeed write about the past, present, and the future. All those things he's commanded to write about. He's already started doing it. And John, since I see questions in your eyes, let me tell you about what you're seeing right now. And we're going to see that happen throughout this book where John's going to see something, he's not going to understand it. It'll be explained to them, explained to him, or he'll ask a question about it. The seven stars, the, the lampstands, 
all have to do with the seven churches. The ones that you've been told to write to. That's what Jesus is telling them. Now, each star represents an angel who's been assigned to each church. So consider this as we move forward in faith to launch Calvary Chapel. As we were doing that, the Lord assigned an angel to watch over Calvary Chapel, Martin County. That's what this text tells us. Jesus isn't personally in the middle of the churches. They're his body. And he still is today because we're part of his body. But consider this possible explanation of why a church? Why an angel for each church? Well, Jesus is over the divine council. We see that in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 19 to 23. We have a very clear picture of the operation of the divine council there. And at present, he has angels and other divine beings uh, that are on this council. Angel is a job title. We also have to remember that. You, we know that we have angels, we have watchers, we have seraphim, uh, we have you know, uh, uh, cherubim. We ha you know, there are different, different job titles. The church is intended to replace them on the divine council in the future. And we'll actually see that in the book of Revelation in chapter 4, but that's yet in the future. As a church, there is an angel assigned to us. He represents us before the Lord and his council and then mediates God's will to us. Angelic mediation of God's will and word to believers, which involve praise and admonition, we see that in the Old Testament, but that seems to be operative in this relationship that we're reading about here in Revelation. Now, Henry Morris says this, he says, admittedly the concept of an angel of God assigned to each church and in some degree responsible for the effectiveness of its ministry is something that is largely unrecognized by Christians. But that's what the teaching of the Lord's words here are. There's been a delegation, there's been an assignment that's taken place involving each church that we see on planet Earth today. Some of the churches that we're going to be studying don't exist anymore. And, and some were very strong and some weren't. And with that, we come to the end of Revelation 1. Jesus picks up in chapter 2, dictating letters to John, dealing with each church. And, and we'll speak more about that next time. Here's the thing that we have to take away today, okay? This book is given to us because Jesus is coming back to take his church to be with him. And the time is very near. It is indeed very near. There's a, a sense of imminency, and that's been intentional in the scriptures, even since Paul was writing in Thessalonians, that the return of Jesus for his church is imminent. That means it can happen at any second. There are no preconditions that have to happen. There are no signs, nothing. Jesus can just show up and say, come up here, and we're out of here just that fast. Everything else has signs. The second coming, and, and we'll, we'll go over a bunch of signs in this study, too. But here's the question. Are you ready for the evacuation operation? If you know Jesus Christ, you are. You're ready to go. But here's the problem. You're going to find out as we study this book that there are reasons why you want to be part of the evacuation. There are things that you don't want to be involved in. There are things that happen during the tribulation that are purely simply God pouring judgment on this planet because it's in unbelief. Don't find yourself left behind. Don't find yourself going through the things we're going to be studying here in this book. Trust me, you don't want to be here. In Revelation, or I'm sorry, in Romans chapter 3, we see this. God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And it's true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are, everyone's sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standards, all of us do. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. That's what he does. That's what he did on the cross. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of sin. 
So what do I have to do to become part of that? What do I have to do to become part of the kingdom? What do I have to do to become a believer so that I don't find myself left behind? I'm glad you asked. Because not a whole lot. <laughs> we all tend to think we have to work our way to heaven before we become believers. And once we become believers, we realize we don't have to. He did all the work for us on the cross. It says this in Romans 10, verse 9. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. It's that easy? Yeah. For it's by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It's by openly declaring your faith that you're saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. There's an A and a B and a C to this. A, and we'll be praying here in a minute. We're going to go through these as we pray. Acknowledge you're a sinner and you just tell him that. The B is believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, then he rose again. And then C, confess that Jesus is Lord. And then you start telling people because you're going to want to. You're going to want to. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time we've had in your word, and we're excited to be into the book of Revelation. We're, we're excited to be able to study a book that promises blessings, a promise that tells us how it's all going to go down here at the end of the age. And, and Lord, we kind of understand that's going to be very, very soon. Some of the things we're going to be talking about might be happening within just a few years. And, and we need to understand that too, Lord. Speak to us as we study and help us to see you but more than that, Lord, give us the, the, the sense that we need to be responsible for reaching others for you. Help us to be a soul-winning fellowship, a soul-winning church, Lord, that is busy about reaching the, the, the world for you and seeing how many we can take along with us when you say, come up here. If you don't know Jesus, now's your opportunity. Just pray along with me. Lord Jesus, I agree that I am a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you died on the cross for me and I believe you rose from the dead for me. Save me, Lord. Forgive me. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. And if you just prayed that, you are now saved. You're a believer in Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you for those who have just given their life to you. We just pray that you'd just help us to have the opportunity to help them to grow now, to become more like you. Thank you now, Lord, for this time we've had today in your word. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being with us today here at the online campus of Calvary Chapel, Martin County. If you've just given your life to Jesus, tell us about it. We actually have a link on our website and on our app. It just says, I want Jesus. Click on that. There's a card to fill out. Let us know who you are and where you live so that if you're local, we want to tie you into what we're doing here at Calvary Chapel, Martin County. But if you're not, we want to tie you in with a church in your local area that will disciple you and help you to grow and become more like Jesus. Thank you, though. Thank you for being with us today. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The, the Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his face to you and give you peace. Thank you for being with us here at the online campus today. Have a great week, and I'm, and I'm really looking forward to being in Revelation chapter 2 with you.